Okay, when this movie came out, um, I think nobody in the world really knew who Bradley Cooper was. In fact, I, I'm sure of it, because when this movie was pitched, it was... Midnight Meat Train starring Brooke Shields. He was the only famous yeah. people. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's been how... Vinnie Jones over. <laughs> no, I wouldn't even hear Vinnie Jones, but it was kind of, in the theaters, it was like Midnight Meat Train starring Brooke Shields, and you're like, what in the world? Yeah. Especially for her doing this kind of movie, and that was kind of the enticement for me to be in, remotely interested in this movie. See, and I probably just missed the boat with it, because yeah, yeah. it was deemed not worthy of an A- release in theaters so it was dropped in dollar theaters it was yeah. I went to college right about the time this was coming out in dollar theaters lived within walking distance of one of the theaters that had it and just didn't realize that theater was there until a couple months later <laughs> so I missed out All on right. this completely yeah, missed, caught it during pandemic shutdown time and now we're watching it again so we can talk about what Clive Barker's movie and then the, the movie that launched Bradley Cooper's career yeah okay. Midnight Meat Train <laughs> grab a bucket let's go Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothy from GoatFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for watching. Thanks for finding us. And for our loyal fans, thank you for uh, to continue to support the show. Hey, you can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out as well. Today we're going to talk about a horror movie from 2008. Uh, came released in the wake of The Dark Knight. So it kind of is almost like, did you know about it? Or Yeah, kind of the vapors. But uh, launched kind of Bradley Cooper film. Career. Yeah, so Midnight Meat Train. Photographer Leon is desperately trying to hit the big time by capturing the darkness of the city. This obsession leads him directly to the subway system, where a clean-cut, bulky, and silent serial killer stalks yeah. and kills passengers on a nightly basis. Okay, uh, to validate that, make sure that everybody knows, recognizes that, it, that it's a whore based on a Clive Barker story, mm -hmm. but you have to, another justification is you have to put a Raimi in it. Yeah, that's fair. I would just find it. Just to make sure that, hey, you recognize this, this is a horrible movie. Well, and in yeah. years to follow, too, yeah. we would also have ourselves kind of like, you, you could recognize a lot more of the people involved in this film purely right. by their relationship to Marvel. You know, Leslie Bibb, the girlfriend from the film, she appears in Iron Man Iron Man, too. a couple months before this movie. Um, she's yeah. married to Justin Hammer himself, Sam Rockwell. We have Bradley Cooper, yeah. who voices Rocket Raccoon, and Vinnie Jones, who's the juggernaut. He played the juggernaut for the X-Men <laughs> things. Yeah, but yeah, not really Marvel Studios, but yeah. we can nitpick about that. Uh, yeah, this movie was came out in August. It kind of like was just getting its traction. It was making money. I think the budget was under like a million. It had to be low budget. It, but thing. it was constantly in the like the top tens of like, and the people were like, what is the title of this movie? And of course, that's what kind of gets you at first. Is what the heck is going? Well, it's the reason I avoided the movie though. Is to be really? honest, because just it's it's one of those on the nose titles. Yeah. And the problem that the movie has, I think it would have sold a little bit better. It's Clive Barker is almost more so than even Stephen King, if you can pop his name on there. Clive yeah. Barker is the Midnight Meat Train. He was a producer. He was very adamant about the film adaptations. We had involvement. Yeah. But it's like, if you put his name on, I'm going to go see the movie. If you didn't, the, the yes. title doesn't really work for me all that well. And then watching the movie, I expect hard, core, gross, carnage, candy. And I don't get that here. Not I actually don't think the movie is all that... that no. Graphic. <laughs> you think so, especially when, like in the early 2000s, Japan was really kicking off phenomenal mm -hmm. horror movies. And I think they wanted to catch that little bit of end of the wave of when the, why they recruited uh, uh, Ryue Katamura, who actually Ryue directed Ryue. Azumi, and worked Alive. with uh, Nightmare Cinema recently in America as well, an anthology film, and also did a Godzilla film from the early 2000s. So, like, yeah. a notable and director did, from that uh, area. Which is a great movie, and hopefully, you can t critique in the future uh, Alive, which is a really great mm -hmm. movie. So it does have very much that very early 2000s Japanese feel to it. It's got elements of it, yeah. yeah. Well, and we have to note, too, that Kitamura came in very late before production was about to begin. Uh, Patrick Tatopoulos, who's a very big like effects uh, worker, I think did the third Underworld film, was originally attached to this film, stepped away from it after a bit, and then right before production they had to scramble and get someone. Okay. So there was kind of that, like, who are we going to get, you know? <laughs> so right. And it looks like the casting was kind of just uh, finding somebody, too. Because you're right, the, the headlining people are people that you don't really recognize. Yeah, because again, Bib unfortunately is, has never really cracked like above the the second tier usually in films. Yeah. Um, Bradley Cooper, I know he had done Wedding Crashers, right. but I don't really know if I can think of a movie I'd seen oh, that rock star that he one. didn't blow up until like Hangover yeah. the following year. Right, because this is the movie that's before Hangover. Yeah. 
and right, and then after this movie, and then you see it go to the see the Hangover, and like he's been in a lot of other movies. Like he's, he's a recognizable right. face, even though yeah. you can't figure out where you saw him. And then <laughs> when we go back to his IMDb, and it's like, wow, he's been in like so many other things. And then this is the one movie that shows that he can headline it. Yep, he can headline a movie, and he can make you money off of it too. Yeah, it's a lot of like recognizable faces that I think a lot of the general public may not have recognized at the time, yeah. and even now, like. Tony Coran, I recognize Tony Coran, who plays the uh, the driver of the the subway. Uh, I recognize him from an underworld film. He played one of the lead vampires. When I see Roger Bart, my mind immediately goes to the guy who gets his his junk cut off in Hostel Part Two. But many of the the people who go to see these movies might not know that. <laughs> and it's funny, you go back and like the newspaper. It said in the ad, Midnight Meat Train, Brooke Shields. Mm. It didn't say Clyde Barker, and I think you're right. I think selling it is far more. Would help a little bit. Well, when I per I, I bought the because movie Rawhead Rex purely because on the Amazon page it said Clive Barker's Rawhead Rex. Like I didn't know anything about that movie, but I was like, oh, it's a Clive Barker film. When I picked out Lord of Illusions and I bought it off the shelf, it said Clive Barker's Lord of Illusions. I will buy a Clive Barker movie regardless of what it's about, purely if his name is There's on there. There's some deaths in Lord of Illusions that are kind of yeah. yeah. But like that's how he works. I think game, maybe you know? they thought that because it's one of his first original short stories that came out from the Book of Bloods, I think Bloods of Books or Books of Blood, Books yeah, of Bloods, yeah, that, that people thought, well, everybody who likes Clyde Barker will recognize this as his story, and that just doesn't. But it would have been a great jumping off point yeah, too, because I think, I think the same been. studio that did this made an anthology film called Books of Blood the following year. Like that would have been a great jumping off point to connect his name to it, to get right. people, get the ball rolling on like creating a brand. Or Clyde Barker, who really had, you know, outside of like Hellraiser, none of his movies really hit as hard as they could. I'm a big oh. fan of things like Nightbreed. Nightbreed, you know, you know, you know, probably go keep doing the work on that. And keep yeah. going back and cutting and cutting and cutting. But like, I don't know if he really had any hits outside of the first, maybe the second Hellraiser movie. Um, and then at that point, he kind of left that franchise behind too. So like, I, I can think see he's why more, there was concern, but that name yeah. means something. But he's such a dabbler. He likes to be a artist, mm -hmm. paints, he does writings, yep. he does other compilations, he's not just a filmmaker. And you'd be hard pressed to find yeah. a uh, documentary on horror films where he doesn't make an appearance talking about something else he likes. Yes. Yeah. So like right. he is, but he's prolific and that's why I think he's got a name for himself. I think when you, when you put a Stephen King on something, that adds, but like Stephen King has a lot of iconic titles. When you hear right. Cujo, you know it's a Stephen King. When you hear even the new right. Firestarter, you know it's a Stephen King. Clyde Barker doesn't have that. Yeah, and I think they should at least put his name on the title. Yeah. Right. Uh, very much. I don't. Uh, going back to this, this is very much a green screeny kind of, isn't it? A little bit. It looks like a lot of green yeah. screen. Yeah. Uh, I think in the art rooms are kind of green screen. Uh, very much. Even though they had a lot of wide exterior shots, I don't think I need those so much. There's, I there's like so the much uh, for a movie that looks so grimy. It, it, it it's got a, such a clean cut visual aesthetic to it. Yes. I don't like the way it's shot. I really don't like the way it's lit. Um, I get that blue. there's like a I get it. You like blue and like brown. Yeah, this yeah. could be in the uh, the grudge cinematic universe where everything's. Well, got we talked about how emo is <laughs> emo is too polished for yeah. what it is, and I, I agree. This is I would like a rough. Yeah, a little more rough. I it. just I, I feel like it's got the clean cut because I mean uh, you know in Japanese horror they they kind of have that perfect balance of like there's a griminess in the horror on screen, but the way it's shot is elegant, and in this it kind of feels like they're doing that here, but with maybe too much flash and that the green screen yeah. comes to add to that too it makes such a clean looking shot of such a grimy movie this doesn't really translate to me and it's I think so they're trying to do on. a little bit like mimic or a little bit yeah. like dark city trying to make the city as a character and I'm not interested yeah, I'm like seeing this, mimic in it yeah yeah <laughs> and I see a little bit like mimic but I'm not interested in this, this city they try to advertise the city as a character that makes it and I really want the characters. Yeah. Well, what I was thinking too is Jonathan Sela did the cinematography, who yeah. had, had also done Max Payne, another movie that I think had a very clean cut, grimy look to it that didn't work. Thankfully, Sela has done a couple other he movies. Found I've it. Been a fan well, of he found it. John Wick was really good. John, it works for John yeah. Wick. Yeah. He's got his like his movement on there now in a, in a place where I feel like he's working with the right people. But between this. And you know, like Max Payne, they're just two like stumbly kind of movies where I just don't like the look of them at all. Yeah, yeah. it's just it looks very green screeny. Mm -hmm. look, nowadays, you can kind of tell. Oh yeah, a little bit. And then the computer graphics of the blood and stuff like that. Yeah. Very computer. age makes fools of us all, but especially CG. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's very like the Japanese thing of the head decapitated, mm -hmm. but it winks at you, and then you pull the camera away. Yeah. That's very Japanese. 
And yeah. I don't like, I do like There's that. There's a lot of, of instances of camera shots in the way the camera moves that feels like they're probably Kitamura's Kittimer, idea. Um, and yeah, just way the aesthetic plays out. It's, it's, the, the, the problem is I like enough elements of it, but I think the movie drags Very so quiet. much. It's so quiet. quiet. And I also, having known the story, I know that in the story we get to see some monsteriness. We get to see some like big bad creature effects. Again, that makes that's a very Clyde Barker esque thing. Is let's show some really messed up creatures, and the movie thinks that Vinnie Jones can be our big bad to the point where like we can find him scary, but like he's not really scary. He's humanized. Yeah, he's so very. yeah he's so human, and the fact that we've seen Vinnie Jones in a number of other films, he acts pretty well for a non speaking role. But I know Vinnie Jones. I'm not scared of Vinnie Jones. Right. And I, I think more. Well, we critiqued another movie where we talked about it was too much of a force mm. and I like the humanization of yeah. like, and then I would like this lead a little bit of a force yeah. and less humanization of Vinnie Jones's character well because th the best part of the movie is the, the last five super, minutes yeah. where we start to get that superhuman flavor to it where we start to yeah. start to understand what's really happening here that's yeah. where I'm like this is the movie I wanted but we're just and I know where it's ending I know it's coming to a close and I'm going to miss out on it now that's the problem is I Pacing think we well. as yeah. viewers know where the movie's going about an hour ahead of time about a half hour in we're like oh this is how it's going to kind of close out and for the most part we're right until about the last five minutes you know there's, 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 yes and there's just some things that just some shots that just didn't need to be there they're just wasting you have mm -hmm. some exterior cityscape shots you have some overhead in the alley a lot of waste of time that I would really focus on the characters. If you want to do green screening, put it in a room, a little more claustrophobic, a little more strew, a lot more in the train. Yep. Um, yeah, I'll stand there by broomstick. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can tell a lot of people are doing that. But that's what I want. I want a closed, compact script. I think you're trying to expand the environment unnecessarily. Yeah. And you're trying to humanize Vinnie Jones unnecessarily. I'd rather be a little more foreboding. Wear some sunglasses or something where you see almost like a robotic monster. What I would like to see is how he reacts to his job. Because this yeah. is a job. You know, Vinnie Jones, is, he's doing the 9 to 5. It just might be 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. Right. Um, and and he's jobs, completing actually. what he needs to do in order to, you know, s you know make his, his role in this ritual, if you will, worth it. We never see, like, we see him doing the killing, and then we cut to black, and we wake up with Bradley Cooper the next morning. And it's like, I want to see, weird edit cut. I want to yeah. see the Vinnie Jones, like, how does he spend his time? You know, let's break down what this guy is. Because, I mean, if you're going to humanize him, show me him in his day, not just him on the train. Uh, show me the relationship between him and Tony Coran more. Yeah, show me more. you could have done more with that than seeing, like, hiring a helicopter to shoot. Yeah, shot because Cooper's role in the film uh, is fairly ornamental. He's driving us to the horror, you know? If you just set, if you show Vinnie Jones' his character in his whole apartment, just sitting there, wasting time at a clock, not motionless, you establish that's what he does. Yeah. He's just waiting for the job to go to the train, and he sits there waiting for the job to come to him. That's far more interesting than I have than any fancy kind yeah. of work. Vinnie Jones is sitting um, in his home waiting for that call for X-Men 4. He's just, he's ready for it. Yeah. So <laughs> I would just say some good things about it. Um, costuming's good. Mm -hmm. Casting's good. Uh, they find some people that really work. Really I think well. the cast is really strong. I yeah. uh, I really like Peter Jacobson. I he's not he's not gonna get called out, but he's the the, the boss at the restaurant. Yeah, plays Otto. We've seen him in in shows like House and he's Transformers. A bit guy. He works really well in the interplay he has with Bradley Cooper. I like that. And again, because the film is all about like getting the meat for the things that live beneath the streets. The fact that she works at a business with a boss who's very meat driven and she's vegetarian driven. Yeah, yeah, like she's vegetarian. You get a lot of that. Yeah, yeah that's that part I found interesting. Uh, I really liked how Bradley Cooper was juxtaposed at the beginning with the ending. The first shot we see of him when he's got the camera and the final shot of the film feel very reminiscent of each other. They're both about him watching in order to take part of something. Yes. And I like that, how that's utilized. Uh, production design, I think, was pretty cool. I like that yeah. the ending was under that like catacomb area. Like I would right, like yeah. more of that. Production I agree. Design. I agree. It just has it has to just get over the threshold yeah. of things that you thought you had to do. And right, I did like the elements, like all the way I, you cited everything. Yeah. But I really concentrate. If you're going to talk about them um, being repulsive by everybody consuming meat, show it. Show it. Go in a restaurant yeah. and everybody's eating meat and acting like animals, and you get almost like. Vomitous about well, reaction. Not to mention, yeah, like the yeah. movie is called The Midnight Meat Train. Like, I'll say this right now the movie does not match the title. 
Yeah. Uh, Something set the tone, like so Dark Tower set a clock time that everything is happening. Why don't yeah. you do that? Well, <laughs> if, if you're gonna, gonna if you're gonna keep the title, which I don't think you should have, I don't, I think you should change the title to right. this. If you're gonna keep the title, show us some meat, like show us some real viscera kind like of like hostile. You know, <laughs> yeah, like get down and dirty with it because people read that title, they expect a, a splatter fest. Mm -hmm. They do. No one's going to this movie going, I wonder if it's gonna get a best picture nomination. Like it's not gonna happen. Right. So show us the meat on the train. Right. Or, or change show, the title. show the restaurant. Everybody's gorging in raw meat and everything, like they do almost in the Howling. Yeah, and you go. Oh, it strikes me as yeah. odd that that a, a short story like the Hellbound Heart had to get changed to Hellraiser because they thought Hellbound Heart wouldn't sell. Cabal had to get changed to Nightbreed because they thought Cabal wouldn't sell. And then they're like, "Yeah, this is probably a good title." Yeah. And like, same with this and Rawhead Rex. They're both bad titles because they don't really give you enough of the movie. And I, you know? I, I think you're right. I think even if you keep the title, you have to maintain something to derive from the title. So that midnight, he goes to work, right? Yeah. So the train, so a lot of, like, you know, texture and meats and everything getting reputed. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it doesn't feel that. I think they try to gloss over, and if you want to do that, change the title. You got to change the title. Yeah. And I know, like, you can think to yourself, uh, it, uh, title doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of things, but the title is how you it's start It's how you movie. sell it, because I remember they sold it. This is Midnight Meat Train starring Brooke Shields. Well, <laughs> well I and I like the poster of Vinnie Jones on the like through the gl the glass like yeah. shine of the train. It's a cool looking poster, and the only reason I say this is because you have certain expectations when you see a movie with this title and this poster that are not met. That's the only reason I bring it up. Is that yeah. no inherently titles are meaningless, but when you get expectations, how do you sell it? Head, you know, and how do you sell it? Mm -hmm. And I think they had a lot of things working against, it. and you had a, probably a director had a style that they wanted to do, and it's obviously love mimic, love dark city. Um, there's really elements of rear window mm -hmm. of him being a photographer, getting in personal people's spaces and going out looking for a story. Um, yeah. And then the love interest breaking into the other apartment. So there's a lot of elements of rear window. But if you're going to use that, lift it up a little bit of some how they yeah. use theirs. Um, I think a yeah. good comparison with, with Mimic too is that, again, these are two directors who came out of working in their native country, came to America to make a movie, and I'm assuming there was some production issues. Just like uh, M Mimic, we all know had production issues because there was an um, there was American producers that wanted an American movie, but they hired a non-American actor right. or director. This is probably the same thing I can imagine. I know that the there was an executive producer brought on board right as the film was coming to a close that Clive Barker was not a fan of because he believes that this movie was shelved in order to make room for other movies that that producer was more involved in, like The Strangers. So I think. I wonder if that had something to do with kind of, you know, looking at the movie, unimpressed, shove it out, but at the same time, it's not a very good movie, so. <laughs> it's very bland. Yeah. It's very bland. It's like paint by numbers. We, If you consumed enough horror movies, it's almost like there, we get to here, we get to here. Mm -hmm. Oh, young body and stuff like that, but right. The movies like Feed yep. did a definite job of showing almost, I don't want to eat meat ever again. <laughs> uh, you had. Uh, another one, Fresh, that's coming mm, out. Yeah. Kind of the same. That's why we're kind of doing this movie. Neon too. Demon. Neon Demon <laughs> is kind of refuting it. But it doesn't, you don't have that texture. And I think that's the problem with it. It's too polished. It's not palpable. And I yeah. want that. I want to feel it almost that you don't want to be in this one. It's almost like the crew came on set with a vision for a movie and then they received the screenplay and were like, oh, well, we're here. I, I don't inherently dislike Jeff Bueller. I think Jeff Bueller as a screenwriter has done some solid work, but I think he's also tri he's tried things in his movies, and I respect that he tries things. Not all those things work, and I mean like things like changing up the order in Pet Cemetery. He did the the remake to Pet Cemetery. His screenplay changes up a lot of the narrative ideas, tries some new things. I don't think they work all that well. Yeah. Same thing with this movie, The Prodigy, he did in 2019. It's an interesting movie that feels I like it's going to go to a place, and then he doesn't. And it's like he's trying a lot of things. They just don't always work for me, and that's kind of what the case is here. Is just like with Pet Cemetery, they both feature elements that are leading to a monster, that are leading to a really cool creature effect, and both of those movies don't show the monster or creature effect. <laughs> and I think one, I agree with you, mm -hmm. and I think one little switch would happen, make it far more effective, is that the character Leon enjoys what he's doing instead of being repulsed by it, that he has to do it. Because, well, that's how the story yeah. is. And, and yeah. I know, you. I, mean, I think if you switch that, and he entices and he enjoys that he's seen uh, a girl almost being assaulted, if he enjoys the, what he's seen as a murder, and he's embracing it, 
rather than being repudiated. Because I don't get how you trying to capture the city and then you see things that disgust you. Well, you keep going after. I think you, you if you enjoyed it, yeah, that makes my the, 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 the dynamic far more interesting. Then his girlfriend gets repulsed. Like you're enjoying this. Stop it. Knock it off. Well, I want to keep going. Yeah, and I think that little switch, but far more effective element to this. Well, film. I think. We, when, as we opened the film, I I thought that's where they were going because they spend a good amount of time early in the film talking. Makes about sense to what we had the ending for, is. right? The, the ending for it, then that makes sense for me. Yeah, and yeah. the story itself leads him to a path where when he sees what's actually going on beneath the city, it drives him insane. And then when he comes up at the end of the the story, he talks about how nice and pretty New York City is. He's changed from being despised by it to thinking how beautiful it is. And I think that's where I thought the character was going to go. He doesn't go there. We start that. We say, you know, this city is disgusting. It's never going to change. It's always going to be a crap hole. Okay. And then, yeah, he doesn't enjoy it, but he's doing it for the job. And it's like, I'll, I'll tell you, as somebody who writes, as creates, if you told me to write in a genre I don't want to write about, I'm not going to give you very much good stuff. And this this is kind of like a genre of photography. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I don't get the profession. I don't get his motivations, really. Yeah. I mean, they explain why he wants to, but... Uh, if you don't want to do photography, pick something else, uh, a different trade. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to really impress Brooke Shields, then why don't you do some modeling or something, like that, <laughs> right? or something like that, or hire for modeling. Yeah, so I, I think right that little switch that he actually enjoys it. You know, um, Clyde Barker likes to shock people. That's mm -hmm. why he writes it. Well, write your character that he enjoys to photograph thinking that. And I think that's what Barker did. That's yeah. the that's the real issue. You know, like Jude Law's character in uh, Road to Perdition, he enjoys yeah. shooting. Photography murder scenes. He yeah. enjoys that almost to its an obsession. Yeah, I would like to see that with this character. As well. I think this is a movie that I'm, I'm going to classify it as. A, it's a bad movie that has a couple dials that just needed to get tweaked one one yeah. number over, and you could yeah. have switched it to being not just an okay movie, but a good or a great movie. Yeah. It's unfortunate that it's such a swing because things like the pacing don't work for me, the effects work it's doesn't quiet. work for me, the lighting, the cinematography yeah. doesn't work. I just think there's a lot of elements here that aren't working but I can see that there is a story in here that's worth telling and that's unfortunate I think that as a short story this would make really well there have been two films based on Books of Blood there was one released right after this and there was a Hulu film version too <laughs> I think this would be at home in a horror anthology I don't think we need an hour 40 and sell it on its own it should be like a collection piece yep. right and probably right the problem is the selling and then tweak a little bit Tune up a little bit of it, like characters, mm -hmm. um, really sell the whole pitch of photography and really be, really show repulsive media. <laughs> well, the shocking thing for me is that is that we have something like Shutter acquired the Creep Show name and has been making Creep Show as a TV show for a number of seasons now. Why doesn't Hulu, who has the rights to a lot of Barker's work, why have they not made a Books of Blood anthology television series and given a one-hour episode to something like this? You could do it, you could do a low budget, and you could tell this story in a little bit more finite of space. I just think we don't need a feature film with this story. Right, and I think uh, you probably have an executive in the office that's kind of in the roadblock. Yeah, yeah. so Something. call me Hulu. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think, right, this small little snippets, and it been a great success. Know how to sell your movie. Yeah. yeah, it's a marketing problem. And again, like the, the changeover of producers probably didn't help the marketing issue of the film. Um, and, and they had enough time to do storyboards, and there's just a lot of fancy stuff that just kind of gloss over the fact. A waste of time. Yep. Yeah. So, have you seen Midnight, Midnight Meat Train? God, yeah. it's hard to get out. Midnight <laughs> Say Meat Train. three times fast, huh? Um, Train, yeah. yeah. Let us know your thoughts on it down below. Do you have another Clive Barker adaptation that's your pre preference, your favorite? It's probably I mean, Hellraiser, I do like Hellraiser, but else. Lore Illusions is just so... The trajectory is, like, way out there. Mm. I kind of like that. So, yeah, like, are you are you more of a Nick? Are you a... Are you a Lord of Illusions? Are you a Hellraiser uh, Nightbreed guy? Huh? Why don't you come over here? Um, let us know in the comments down below. Or do you have a favorite Book of Blood story that has not been adapted yet? Yeah, he's written a lot you of know. stuff that's not horror. Yeah, the, well, he's written a lot of stuff that hasn't been made into movies that could be. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so let us know down in the comments your thought on this film and about Clyde Barker as well. And while you're down there, liking and subscribing are two things you can do that take less than five seconds and they help our channel out. It and does. also make sure you never miss an episode. Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, Nick, you mentioned that Patreon already, but let's yeah. say it again. Cancel one cup of coffee every month from your caribou. Come join the Patreon for as low as a dollar a month, and you can help us pick the different films that we are doing on the show in future episodes. Yeah. That's all we got there, guys. So, once again, you can find all my film reviews over at GoFilmReviews.com. Uh, you can find my podcast, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts where I interview local filmmakers from the Twin Cities area. 
perfect. So let's go grab a salad and we'll see you next time. Salad. <laughs>